Okay, so in this case, we're going to instead do uh, House Bill 235, uh, Delegate Resnick. Take it away. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. If I can have Mr. Jim Chen from Tesla Motors join me as well. What? Is Delia Carter in here? Is my eyesight, like, totally failing me? No. Okay. Go ahead, Delegate Resnick. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members of the committee, I apologize for the slight tardiness. I was meeting with my chairman in the, in the HEO room. Um, before you is H. Bill 235, Vehicle Laws, Manufacturers, and Distributors, Sale of Electric and Non-Fossil Fuel Burning Vehicles. This bill uh, is a response to something that has been law here in Maryland for somewhere going on 30 years. Uh, in the mid-80s, mid this legislature passed a law that basically said that manufacturers cannot sell directly, car manufacturers cannot sell directly to, uh, to consumers. They have to go through franchise license, um, franchise dealerships, franchise licensees. Um, we actually don't oppose that law and are not looking to repeal it in any way. What we're trying to do here is open up um, a, a small gap for uh, niche car market, car manufacturers that are trying to establish themselves and make their, make their way uh, in the electric car market. Uh, with me today is Mr. Jim Chen, uh, who represents Tesla Motors, one of these kinds of uh, manufacturers that are trying to sell here in Maryland. Um, and we are trying to create an exception uh, that would allow them to be able to come in and sell directly as a manufacturer uh, without having to franchise. And the reason they're trying to do this is, uh, for those of you that may have uh, had the opportunity to look at or research a car like Tesla's, it's a car that doesn't have a lot of the traditional um, features that are that are, uh, traditional manufactured um, combustible engine car has. It has no engine, none, no engine whatsoever. Uh, it has no gear shifter. It has no uh, ignition uh, port. It has none of these things. It is not a typical car. And as a result, selling it and, and, and even servicing it becomes a very uh, difficult process, uh, prospect for somebody who uh, is not the manufacturer itself. So we're trying to allow them to come in and be able to sell here in the state of Maryland. Maryland is a state that they are very interested in coming to. Uh, several years ago, even before this bill was even a, a glimmer in my eye, uh, the, they opened up a, what they call a gallery in the Montgomery Mall in Bethesda, Maryland. This is a gallery where you can come, you can look at the car, you can ask questions about the car, but you can't buy the car. You can't ask about price. You can't do anything that, that begins the transaction process. The minute you start doing that, they either have to send you to the District of Columbia, where it is currently legal to sell directly, and they have a dealership, or they have to send you online. I don't know how many of you have bought cars online without ever test driving one. It's probably a difficult prospect to do. Um, in addition, they have opened in Rockville, Maryland, a, a service center. It's the regional service center that services Tesla vehicles be, from, uh, what is it, North Carolina all the way up to New Jersey. They opened it in Maryland, in Rockville. The reason they did this is because we are such a great target for their, for their market, for their, for their uh, product. Um, they are committed to this state, and they want to be able to sell and service and, and work in this state and expand in this state. So we have before you a bill that would allow them to come in under very, very strict circumstances. We have been working with the, uh, the Maryland Auto Dealers Association. We have had great working relationship with them. They have been very welcoming and opening, open to us. Um, and we have negotiated a number of amendments. Um, unfortunately, the amendments are not final and before you because there was a little glitch with the amendment office this morning. Uh, they came back with some language that was erroneous. So we're trying to get that fixed. But what the amendments essentially do there are four major amendments. Uh, I'm sorry, three major amendments. One is in working with the dealers, we have made sure that Tesla would allow would be allowed to sell directly to consumers and be com in complete compliance with existing regulations that are already imposed on dealers. Uh, we want to clarify, and make sure that that language is succinct. Tesla does not want to do anything 
outside of what a dealer is currently allowed to do or required to do. They want to act like a dealer and comply with every regulation that a dealer complies with, and we are making sure that the language that's in this bill uh, is specific to that. Two, we want to ensure that no company can create a subsidiary to sell exclusively the, uh, electric or non-fossil fuel burning vehicles um, under this exception. So what we're trying to avoid is, for example, a car company that is established manufacturer, whether it be Ford or GM or Toyota or whoever, to be able to create a subsidiary company that sells exclusively electric vehicles and comes in. We're trying to avoid that as well. Uh, what we want to do is, is open the market up to, a, to legitimate manufacturers that are small and, and innovative. And then three, uh, in working with the dealers, we've limited the number of licenses that a manufacturer can receive to four new licenses. Um, in addition, under the amendment, we will be allowed uh, to grandfather Tesla's two existing locations as licenses. So Tesla would be allowed six uh, as long as those two locations are grandfathered. Any other manufacturer that would fall under this exception uh, would be allowed only four. So, um, and then we also will remove language from the amendment that allows uh, Tesla to, uh, through statute, to use their mall location as a license location. They intend to, to, to apply for a license for that, but we all agreed that the statute is not the proper place for that, and we would do it properly through regulation. Um, and so that language is being struck as well through the amendments. So with that, uh, I want to turn it over to Mr. Chen to, to talk more about his, his company uh, and what they're trying to do here. And I would ask the committee for a favorable report. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm sure, <clears throat> pardon me, the, the manufacturing and dealer licensing uh, regulations in the state of Maryland are pretty complicated. I'm sure you're aware of that. Uh, I'm asking if your manufacturing slash dealer um, responsibilities for Tesla are going to stay the same as the current manufacturing versus dealer requirements in that, as I recall it, current law says that the manufacturer sets prices, the manufacturer sets and controls the website, the manufacturer controls the advertising, not the dealer, mm -hmm. which is a little bit different in most states, but that's the way it is here in Maryland. So is it your intention to have that manufacturing slash dealer requirement to stay the same for Tesla? And if so, why? Well, in this particular case, um, they will apply for a dealer's license because they will be operating as a dealer. They will not actually be manufacturing in the state as of yet, but we have hopes. Uh, maybe one day. Um, so in this particular case, they will be getting a dealer's license to be able to operate like a dealer to, to, to sell vehicles, to trade in vehicles, to, to service vehicles. Um, as the manufacturer itself, they will obviously set the price for their own product when they sell. They will obviously maintain their own website. Um, they will not, they will, in no way will that relationship be bifurcated because they are one in the same entity. But the pro if I may, Mr. Chair, uh, to, just to follow up, the problem sometimes uh, begins to initiate itself when you have more than one dealership. If you're going to have six dealerships, one manufacturer, then the dealerships may want to vary their servicing requirements, uh, like we're going through right now with the airbag scenarios. The, uh, the, the dealers may want to manuf uh, uh, change their, their uh, servicing requirements and their pricing requirements. But in Maryland law, the manufacturer controls that, mm -hmm. not the dealerships. So I, uh, I just want to make sure we understand what we're getting, uh, how we're going down this road, if you understand what I'm saying. I, I do. Um, in this particular case, the manufacturer, whether it's Tesla Motors or uh, there's a... Um, Google Motors, I know Google's looking at creating an electric vehicle. Um, Apple Motors, they're looking at creating an electric vehicle, app, the Apple car company. In this, in, in, in whoever it may be, is the manufacturer. They will set all that, and they will be, in fact, the dealer as well. 
And so there's not going to be a difference between the six different dealerships because Tesla will hold all those licenses. Yeah. Yeah, it's, given your desire to keep this restricted to small, innovative companies, uh, would you accept a, a, um, uh, an amendment that would limit, say, the, the market cap of an uh, applicable company to, say, $25 billion or so? Well, I mean, it, it's a small company in the sense of the number of vehicles that they sell. But, you know, say if it's, if it's Apple that creates an electric vehicle that comes in, Apple, between all of its different products and lines, is a multi-billion multi dollar company. Tesla is a multi-billion dollar capitalized company. So uh, the, the, the business of, of manufacturing, creating, designing, manufacturing, and selling a car is a large financial business. Um, and so limiting the, the, the capitalization of a company, one, it's not really all that relevant to the ability to sell a car. We are limiting it to exclusively to a particular line of vehicles, electric or non-fossil fuel burning, and that should handle the situation of um, large companies, large manufacturers coming in and being able to, to sell their product. Well, so, so you don't want any sort of, you want any uh, safeguards to make sure that this is a small company? either in volume of sales or uh, uh, market cap or some other. Well, like so I said, it's, it's not a, really a small company then. It's it, not a it's, small it's company. It's one big company that wants to have a particular product that competes with other big companies, doesn't it? it, it well, I think, we're, I think we're talking about variations of big in this case. Um, we're talking about, you know, a... a $30 billion capitalized company versus a $300 billion capitalized company. Well, I'm, I'm looking at the General Motors cap, and that's $37.5 billion, and the Tesla market cap, which is $26.3 billion. Is that, isn't, that the, isn't that the order of magnitude that we're talking about? That's, that's about right. I don't, yeah, that's about okay. right in terms thank, of the numbers, yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I had a couple questions. I, you know, th I know technology is moving us in transportation in ways that, you know, communication was maybe t 15, 20 years ago. New, new things are coming up all the time, and we're going to have to catch up and figure out how to deal with some of these things. So I appreciate the bill. I'm, uh, I'm still trying to get my mind around it. I did want to ask you about another company, and I, I, I saw a story in the Washington Post about a company that's going to be manufacturing uh, vehicles at National Harbor, and um, I wondered uh, if you had any understanding of how this bill might impact that operation. Yeah, I, I know what you're talking about. The company is called Local Motors. Um, and this bill will not affect them in any way, shape, or form, and let me explain why. Um, th so for those of you who don't know, this company, Local Motors, I think from, they're from the West Coast, uh, Arizona, New Mexico, somewhere. They're a company that claims to be able to uh, manufacture vehicles through 3D printing, um, and they will print the vehicle, drop the engine in, drop the components in, and suddenly you have a car that you can print right there on the spot. They could do it from anywhere, and they'd like to open a, fa a facility in, um, in National Harbor. A uh, couple of issues with that. One, they want to manufacture in the state. That's a whole other issue. That's not addressed by this bill in any way, shape, or form. Two, I, my understanding is is that they have a line of vehicles, some with combustible engines, some with electric motors. Um, they are not exclusively an electric vehicle company. And this bill limits the product line to exclusively electric or non-fossil fuel burning vehicles. So in the case of local motors, um, frankly, from my perspective, they don't fall under this bill. And under existing law, or even if we adopted this law, I don't believe that they would legally be allowed to sell or obtain a dealer's license. Uh, there seem to be no further questions for the sponsor, so we'll go to the first uh, proponent, uh, James, Chen, James Chen with Tesla Motors. And if you could keep it under two minutes, that would be terrific. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman uh, and members of the committee. Okay. Again, my name is James Chen. I am the Vice President of Regulatory Affairs for Tesla Motors. 
Tesla Motors was started in 2003 by five Silicon Valley engineers seeking to end uh, the United States' dependence on oil in the transportation sector, particularly foreign oil. Um, we, we're doing this through uh, exciting new technology in electric vehicles uh, at ever-decreasing price points and increasing volumes. We started with our Tesla Roadster, a two-seat sports car that went 0 to 60 in 3.6 seconds and had 245 miles of range on a single charge. It was, until that time, the only electric car that had these type of statistics. Uh, granted, that car was very expensive. It was a list price of approximately $110,000, and we only produced 500 cars a year for approximately five years. Uh, but what it did was it was the proof of concept that electric vehicles could be exciting and it could be domestically produced. From there, we went to our next car, the car we're currently selling, the Model S. Winner of the 2013 Motor Trend Car of the Year. This is a car that seats up to five adults and two kids in rear-facing seats, uh, has up to 300 miles of range, and now goes 0 to 60 in as little as 3.2 seconds. Uh, this car is, uh, starts at a base price of 70000 We've taken approximately half the cost out of the car. We're not done there. In about three years, we'll be introducing and releasing our Model 3, uh, a vehicle about the size of a BMW 3 Series or Audi A4, with at least 200 miles of range, seating for at least four adults, and at a price point starting at $35,000. We're doing this uh, in, uh, introduction of new technology in the classic American fashion of the low volume, high price, mid volume, uh, lower price to show that electric vehicles can be done. Uh, these are cars that are produced in the United States, 100% assembled in the United States, um, and using domestic sources of energy, electricity, to power them. Uh, we believe at this nascent stage of the technology, it's important for Tesla to sell these directly because these do involve more of an education component than anything else. Uh, on average, it takes our store, uh, our product specialist, two to three hours to educate consumers about how electric vehicles are in many ways vastly superior to the incumbent technology of internal combustion. Uh, quite simply, franchise dealers don't work for us at this point. Uh, franchise dealers are set up to move large volumes of vehicles very quickly. Last year, we produced 35,000 cars for worldwide distribution. This year, if we hit all our marks, we'll produce 50,000. We are slowly ramping up, but unable to do that, we need to be able to reach consumers directly and uh, sell our product directly. For that reason, uh, we have been working with uh, Delegate Resnick, uh, and we support House Bill 235 to allow us that limited number of stores to be able to reach out to consumers directly. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to take any questions. The first question will be from uh, Delegate Otto. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just for my curiosity, the gentleman from Tesla, are these, uh, do these come equipped with a smoke detector? Thank you very much. Uh, I guess the question I had was about um, how we have right now this whole net we have a lot of people that are employed in dealerships across the state and we have a few manufacturers in the state but um, I just want to understand if if there's a way if they're working with you to come up with you know a, a way to deal with this so that it doesn't undermine their businesses as well. I mean, they're successful businesses that work well and support the communities that they live in, where they operate. And I, I think, you know, we want to make sure that it's not an unfair advantage. Absolutely. And we've actually been working very closely with the dealers over the last few weeks. The amendments that I described in my testimony are amendments that we have hashed out with the dealers. And if I am correct, they will be coming up and testifying, uh, supporting this bill with the amendments that I have presented. So we are working with them, and, and we do not see them as competition. We see this as a new, uh, a new industry, a new business uh, that will employ more people, not take them away from, from others. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for the sponsor of the bill. Um, have you attempted to work with General Motors, who is in opposition of the bill, and can you tell me how that's been going? We have. We, we had made contact with General Motors um, some time ago. We had met once. They presented us with, with their 
uh, concerns. They presented us a couple of amendments. Uh, we tried to get everybody in the room together, to be blunt. Um, we got the dealers in the room. We invited General Motors. They did not come to that particular meeting uh, where we worked out all of our issues with General Motors. I suspect that the the amendments that we are presenting actually deal with, with most, if not all, of General Motors' concerns. Um, at the end of the day, though, what we are asking for is a dealer's license, not a manufacturer's license. And so this is not really competition with General Motors. Um, we sell uh, in the state of Maryland. We have, we have individuals have purchased as many Teslas as they have Volts or Nissan Leafs. Um, but the market is growing. It is not taking away from each other. People who purchase Teslas don't choose between, and I don't mean any disrespect to any other car company, but somebody who wants to buy a Tesla isn't sitting at home going, well, I think I'm going to buy a Tesla, but maybe I'll get a Ford Explorer, or maybe I'll get a, you know, a, a, a Nissan Pathfinder. They don't make those choices. People who want to buy Teslas, they go buy Teslas. Uh, question for the Tesla representative. Um, these people who know that they want to buy Teslas and go buy them, uh, what is the median income of a Tesla purchaser? Uh, our customer uh, our customer base actually runs all over the gamut. Not surprisingly, with a starting price at 70000 uh, mostly our customers are high net worth individuals. I have, I don't have statistics for you, but I do know in speaking with customers, I have met with retired professors and teachers who have actually stretched to buy a Tesla because they, they like the mission, they like the idea of being able to drive a zero emissions vehicle that was made, it was invented and made in the United States. So yes, for now, it's skewed towards the higher end, uh, some folks towards the lower end, but as we continue to iterate the technology, uh, get to economies of scale, and bring that price point down, we expect to see a broader and broader spectrum across the uh, socioeconomic uh, scale. Well, I don't, I don't expect you to provide me with anything that's proprietary, but you say you don't have access to it. I'm, uh, Tesla has, must have information that, that they know what the median income of their purchasers are, right? I believe our sales department would have that. I don't have that on is me that, right now. If that's not proprietary, would you, could you provide that to the committee? Uh, I can look into that. And uh, I, again, I understand there's, there are certain things that you hold unto yourself properly because you're a profit-making company. So. Well, uh, as part of my role as Associate General Counsel, I also have to worry about privacy concerns as well of our customers. But I will certainly check into that. Uh, okay. But don't – are you telling me that the median income of your purchasers intrudes on the privacy of, of your customers? Uh, I'm saying that revealing the income levels of our customers may, in fact, intr uh, intrude on the privacy of those customers. That I, said, that's not, not the question not I asked, no. sir. I, I said – are you telling me that revealing the median income of your customers intrudes on anyone's privacy? Sir, I, I'm saying, I'm not saying no to your request, sir. I'm okay. saying I don't know if I have that information, and I will certainly look it up for you. That's all I have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, has Tesla ever uh, in any state attempted to market its vehicles through conventional dealerships? No, we have not. And it, it, is this a part of your business plan from the get-go? Um, and I guess maybe if you could elaborate a little bit more as to why that doesn't match your business plan, your, your model for sales. Yeah, it was a conscious business decision, decision by the company because we understood that in order to introduce this new technology, we are in a position to best do this ourselves. Uh, we have seen others try this and fail. For example, there were two startup electric companies that started around the same time as Tesla, Fisker and Coda. They both did try to sell through franchise dealers. I'm not saying that's the reason, the sole reason they failed, but it's certainly one of the reasons why both of those companies are now bankrupt today. Uh, you don't also, you also, we also saw, for example, last year Consumer Reports published a study where they sent in anonymous shoppers to Nissan dealers and to Chevy dealers to attempt to buy an electric car a Nissan Leaf or a Chevy Volt. Uh, it, that article published that most, most times the dealers turn those buyers away. 
from buying those cars and instead steer them towards internal combustion engine equipped vehicles, cars that those dealers could move more quickly. Uh, another point was that when GM came out with the Cadillac ELR, the Cadillac version of the Volt, fully half of the Cadillac dealers refused to carry that car. They did not want to make the investments. So based on what we've seen and our own experience, we believe that getting to the consumer with this new technology directly is the best course for introducing electric vehicles. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Chen, I was just a little bit late coming in, so I may have missed this, but um, you have similar uh, working arrangements in how many other states? Uh, I'm, sure, I'm not sure I follow you. Follow well, your this, the, this, the request that you're making for Maryland to, to go manufacture direct, not through a dealership, how many other states are you already operating in this manner? We are operating in 35 states currently. And how about our surrounding states? Who surrounds Maryland that has the same similar agreement? Uh, we, are, we have stores open in uh, Washington, D.C., uh, Pennsylvania, New York, Massachusetts. Uh, we will be opening up a store in Virginia next month. Uh, we also have stores in North Carolina, uh, and I think those are the immediate surrounding states. Thank you very much. Any further questions for this witness? If not, thank you very much. We'll proceed to Bob Erdman, who is uh, in favor of the bill. And following Bob Erdman will be Lanny Hartman. Uh, good afternoon, members of the committee, Mr. Chairman. My name is Robert Erdman. I live in Potomac, Maryland, and I'm representing myself. I'm a supporter of House Bill 235. Uh, we have a Tesla Model S that will be two years old in April. Um, we really love the car. It has lived up to its reputation as one of the finest cars made in the U.S. I drive it every day. Uh, last April, our family drove down to Orlando. It was our longest road trip. So four of us, we went down. We used the Tesla superchargers. We needed six of them to get down. I think it took about an hour and a half longer than it would have in a gas car due to my reckoning. Um, that's using the car. We've had to bring the Tesla to this Tesla service center a couple times. Once I have the, ro the tires rotated, and when I rotated the tires, they, they added some service bulletins. They kept it overnight, and they gave me a loaner. And the loaner is actually better than my car, and they offered to, to go take my car back and pick up the loaner when they were done. So I really appreciate that. Um, as a citizen of Maryland, I'd like to be able to discuss the cost of vehicles of new technology without having to travel outside the state. Specifically, I'd like to be able to discuss and order a vehicle from Tesla without going to Washington, D.C., which is what I had to do when I got my car. Uh, there's a great deal to learn about owning an electric car. Um, it's clear to me why it's important to allow the manufacturers of new technology to directly represent and sell the cars they make. It takes an effort, an extra effort, to educate the potential buyer of this new technology, especially for a purchase that's so expensive and one that uses relatively new technology. So we we bought our Tesla for these reasons. First, to support the environment. Second, to buy a car that was made in the U.S. And third, uh, to support, to get a vehicle whose fuel was sourced in the U.S. We actually use the Pepco 100% wind option for our vehicle. In summary, I love the car. I love the Tesla service. And I think it's important to allow cars with new green technologies to be freely sold in America, uh, in Maryland. Um, I support HB 235. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, thanks for your time. Thank you. And we'll go to the next person on this panel, uh, Lanny Hartman. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, my name is Lanny Hartman. I live in Columbia, Maryland. And I'm here as a person who's interested in buying a Tesla. And I've been to the Tesla facility at Montgomery Mall. And the staff there are very informative. I get to learn about the, the car. It, it, it looks beautiful. It um, has a very high safety rating. It uh, doesn't come from a place like Germany, Japan, or Korea. It's made in the United States. It runs on electricity that's made in the United States, and that's important to me. But uh, you, when you're in the car buying process, it's, uh, it's all about the bottom line. How much does this cost? And when I ask that question, I get a very strange answer. I get, uh, they said, we're, sorry, we are limited by state law from discussing price. 
And I, and I wrote that down because I found that very, very strange. Um, Tesla is a innovative product, and I think it should be encouraged to be uh, freely offered and uh, in in the state of Maryland. And we should be able to talk about things like the price, being able to buy it, being able to let the car company do the, all the uh, the fun DMV or MVA work for you. So I'm here to ask the legislature to please uh, remove these limits that that, uh, that are being told to me that are they are in place. So I support uh, HB 235. Thanks. Thank you very much. Are there any questions for these two gentlemen? If not, thank you very much. We'll go to the next proponent, uh, Jen Brock Cancellieri uh, of the League of Conservation Voters. Thank you. Good afternoon, members of the committee, Chairman Barve. My name is Jen Brock Cancellieri. I'm apparently already over on time. <laughs> um, I am the deputy director with the Maryland League of Conservation Voters. We're a statewide nonpartisan uh, organization that uses political action and education to protect our air, land, and water. And we also submitted um, testimony on behalf of 10 other groups um, that support this legislation. For the sake of your time, I'm the only one testifying in person today. Most of the cars that we drive use fossil fuels that create harmful air pollution that make us sick, contaminate our water, and are causing strange and dangerous weather. By authorizing this bill, we have an opportunity in Maryland to take an important step in economic development that will both create jobs and reduce our carbon footprint. This um, bill, as you heard, will uh, encourage the sale of more electric vehicles in Maryland rather than other parts of the state. And the current law is just bad news for Maryland because it's limiting the electronic, electric vehicle market, which has grown exponentially and is projected to grow even further. In 2011 alone, the electric vehicle industry brought in close to $15 billion, and the sales in the first um, 10 months of 2014 were 25% higher than 2013. We don't have the numbers for 2014 yet in its entirety. So in closing, I would just uh, reiterate that we urge a favorable report on this legislation. We think it's good for Maryland, good for jobs, good for the environment. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Any questions? We have Delegate Healy. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I, I wanted, since you, you, you talked about carbon footprint, and using electricity, certainly, I mean, there's a lot of carbon used to generate electricity in this country. And so, so I, I, unless we're all hooked to, to water wheels and windmills, I, I mean, I'm not sure. Do you have data that shows the difference of between using fossil fuels in cars and using them indirectly through plugging it in? <laughs> yeah, sure. That's a fair question. I can get you that data. I did not prepare that for today. Your body also, in a different committee, is considering a bill tomorrow that we are um, prioritizing this session that would um, increase the amount of energy that Marylanders purchase that comes from renewable sources, but you are absolutely correct. The person that just testified before that I just met today, um, he chose to use 100% wind power to power his vehicle. Um, so you are right. I think at the same time, however, um, I, I, I've taught my four-year-old sort of talks about when we walk along the street, she's, she talks about air pollution that's created by cars. And so this is a step that we can take. It's a pretty straightforward step. <laughs> um, and uh, cars create air pollution. This is the type of car that doesn't. And it seems silly that we, are, we have a hurdle in place in Maryland to allow folks to buy a cleaner car if they choose to. Uh, unless there are any further uh, questions, thank you very much. We will now go to uh, Peter Kitzmiller on behalf of the Auto Dealers Association, signed favorable with amendments. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Peter Kitzmiller. I'm the president of the Maryland Automobile Dealers Association. We represent 300 franchise new car and truck dealers across the state of Maryland. Uh, I was intending to be very brief, but I feel obligated to respond to some of the comments of the first panel. We are here today in support of Senate Bill 235 with the, with the amendments. We appreciate Delegate Rednick working with us. 
Uh, I, I do have to say, at the end of the day, Tesla builds an electric car. It's an electric car. I have, I believe, five fully electric models being sold by dealers in Maryland currently, and four more are coming this year. Um, the idea that Tesla doesn't want to sell cars to dealers because dealers don't know how to sell electric cars is just silly. An electric car is not rocket science. Uh, the article that was referred to uh, in, in Consumer Reports that talked about dealers switching people uh, from Leafs and Volts to, to, to gasoline engine cars, if you read the article closely, it was because the customer explained to the salesperson one of them had a, had a, a round trip commute of like 85 miles, which frankly for a leaf at this point isn't going to work very well for that customer. So the salesman did their job and explained to them uh, you know, what the vehicle could do, what it couldn't do. They might want to consider other options. Automobile dealers are in business to sell vehicles. We don't care whether it's an electric car, a gasoline car, a diesel car. We want to sell what's best for our customers. Uh, again, we, we support this bill today. Uh, Tesla has a business model which they've decided at this point to not use franchise dealers. I believe as time goes on and they progress, that's exactly what they're going to end up doing is, is, is working with dealers. They're not there yet. Uh, the law in Maryland that prevents manufacturers from owning dealerships was put into place to prevent unfair competition so that Ford didn't own one dealership in Baltimore and all the other five Ford dealers were independent franchisees and would be treated unfairly. Tesla does not have franchise dealers. Uh, we recognize that. Uh, this was a big step on our part uh, not to fight this. If you check around in other states, it's been battle royal. Uh, we think this is the smart way to go, so we're here today to support it. But I, but I would reiterate that uh, Tesla makes an electric car. It's a great car, but it's just a car. <laughs> uh, any questions for Mr. P uh, Kitzmiller? All right. Uh, thank you very much. We will now go to the opponents. We have both Paul to Paul Taberzi and Chris Grimaldi from General Motors. Chairman Barve, Vice Chair Stein, members of the committee, uh, my name is Paul Taberzi. I'm a lawyer from Baltimore. It's great to be with some friends of long standing. And uh, those of you who were newly elected, congratulations. This is a wonderful committee. And I've been before the committee for many years. I'm very honored to represent General Motors in the state of Maryland. General Motors is the only manufacturer today manufacturing products in Maryland, and we employ hundreds of Marylanders. GM has chosen Maryland as an investment state. GM has invested millions and millions of dollars over the past hundred years, first at Broning Highway in Baltimore, and now in the beautiful state-of-the-art facility in White Marsh, where I grew up. You ought to go there if you haven't seen it. Some of you have been there. State-of-the-art facility where there are hundreds of UAW employees building electric motors. So we commend Tesla. We commend the sponsor. But we've been a leader in electric cars for many years. And in this state, we're the only manufacturer building products in the state, electric motors that are used around the country. We're very, very proud of that. This committee has a tradition of supporting electric vehicles. You've passed the tax credit for electric cars. You passed the HOV lane bill. And I'm proud to say today you can walk down the street and buy a Volt or now a Spark, which is the smaller electric car that GM has. Great products. So we're, we're a leader in this. We're very proud of it. Um, we do oppose the bill as filed. And let me just say one thing with respect to my friend, Delegate Resnick. My mom told me, if invited, go to the meeting. What well, we weren't invited, so we didn't miss any meetings. We'd be happy to continue to chat with him, but we weren't invited to the meeting. We do have concerns about the bill as filed that I'll ask Mr. Grimaldi to speak to. Um, one thing that when you look at the other states, the subcommittee chair asked a good question, Delegate Beidel. You find in most states limits on the number of facilities, and many states have what you would call grandfathering provisions which in this case would be two facilities, the two that are at present in the chair's uh, home county in Montgomery County. So one approach, if you looked at other states, they would grandfather what's going on here to those two facilities only. But I think what the sponsor is asking for is, is more than that, four or five or six facilities. So there is one point of departure uh, on that. Um, so with that, uh, Chris Grimaldi is here at my request. He's a, a lawyer with General Motors who has worked on these issues in other states and 
would love to ask him to testify, Mr. Chair, and then we'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Oh, thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Again, my name is Chris Grimaldi, and I'm the Regional Director for the Mid-Atlantic and Northeast East States for General Motors. I've had this capacity for two years now. I've been with GM and other capacities before that. I thank you for the opportunity, and I appreciate you uh, considering our point of view. I've I found over the last two years that the legislature has been very receptive to our concerns, and, and, and I can... We'll expect that to continue, and I, and I thank you whether or not we agree um, on the final outcome of this issue. Um, as Mr. Taberzi stated, General Motors has long been involved in electric vehicle production, and the environmental benefits that the League of Conservation Voters uh, uh, discussed are, are ones that we hold uh, as core values for uh, us as well. We, we started with the uh, EV1 in the mid-'90s. Uh, the EV1 uh, failed but it didn't fail because of our automobile dealers. It failed because of the market. We now have a, a product that Mr. Taberzi said, the Chevy Spark, which is with, when you account for Maryland and federal tax incentives is around $18,000. That vehicle will now be made available to Maryland residents soon. We have the Chevrolet Volt, which has been in production for a long time. And we have the Cadillac ELR, which is a, a higher end $75,000 luxury, luxury vehicle. So I think ultimately that when we're looking at this issue, our main concerns is, are in the nature of equity. So we're an electric vehicle manufacturer, yet we comply with Maryland law. And Maryland franchise law, I think as many of you know, prescribes almost every facet of the relationship between an automobile manufacturer and an automobile dealer. And we and our dealers work su successfully within that construct, and we have for years. So ultimately, I... I, I recall the Tesla representative stating that Tesla made a conscious, conscious decision not to use automobile dealers to sell its vehicles. Well, that conscious decision is one that is now directly in contravention with Maryland law. And so from our standpoint and from sort of the equity standpoint, there shouldn't be any exemption for anyone because it would be fairly simple for Tesla with the success it's had already to contract with any entrepreneur in this state and to have as many dealerships as they would like subject to the confines of the law that all manufacturers, whether they're large or small, have to operate under. So in, in closing, again, I thank you for your consideration. Um, we are electric vehicle manufacturers. The Chevy Spark has no engine. Our dealers do a phenomenal job of explaining all of the technology in our electric vehicles. They are trained heavily. They provide the best service and, and sales to our consumers in Maryland. And I think when you look at what Mr. Taberzi alluded to about what other states are doing, General Motors recognizes, I can tell you directly about New York State, that there were five Tesla locations that were operating that through a loophole or through some other uh, a defect in the law that were already operating. And so when Tesla came into New York State, they saw, an, they saw a, a change in the law that would allow them to have carte blanche in as many dealerships as they would like to. When the legislature ultimately decided to es essentially grandfather their, their existing stores, General Motors with, withdrew its opposition. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. So, so to make that point, Mr. Chair, in this case, there would be two facilities and if you were to pass the bill, you should limit it to those two. That would be the grandfathering consistent with what other states have done. Um, there are two letters from gentlemen who couldn't be with us today, but they're very powerful letters, one from the local leader of the United Auto Workers and one from Mr. Tiger, who does run our wonderful planet, White Marsh. So they couldn't be with us in person, but please take a look at their letters uh, in the file. We appreciate your hearing from us. All right. Uh, first question goes to... Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. I just, uh, you may have just answered this, so let me just pr probe a little, little bit. Uh, are there amendments to this bill that would make it palatable to, to General Motors? Do you have uh, specific uh, issues that can be addressed through amendment? Uh, let me let me address that, Delegate Healy. Good question. I, I I haven't studied the amendments from Delegate Resnick. We just got them. As he said, there was some bill drafting. I do think there's a point of departure on the number of facilities. So if you were going to pass the bill, we would ask that you limit it to the two facilities. And I don't. That's not where the proponents are. 
They won, I think, six, which we think is too much. That's one port of, point of departure. We'll be happy to look at the other language, and to be fair, I think there's some provisions in there that are reasonable that we may be okay with it. But the significant difference is the two versus the six, to be direct. Right, Chris? I would say yes. I mean, I, I haven't reviewed them yet either. I mean, there are, there are issues about allowing other electric vehicle manufacturers to also uh, escape the provisions of Maryland statute, which we'd have to take a look at. But I, I think that. But, but you know, I want to be direct. Delegate Holmes made a good point earlier. This is a significant departure from Maryland law. So, you know, there's no reason to rush to judgment. The committee ought to look at this, be comfortable with this, because this is a big deal. It's a big change. But to answer your question, we'd be happy to look at the amendments, but the two grandfathering, I think, would be important to us and what I think many other states have done, not the six. Okay. Um, next question goes to uh, Mr. Hoffman. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just just a, a, a couple of questions. Um, one, I noted that the, uh, that the Dealers Association um, and was supporting the bill, and no other manufacturers um, at all are, are opposing the bill. So I'm trying to figure out why it is that everybody else is supporting the bill and General Motors has chosen um, to oppose the bill. Well, I, I, I won't speak on behalf of Mr. Kitzmiller because he, he speaks on behalf of his association. I, I can tell you that the, automob the Alliance of Automobile Manufacturers, of which General Motors is a member, were, uh, had a position of opposition to these bills last year. And in fact, they opposed the bills in New York and in other places around the country. This year they have made a change. And I'm not sure I quite, I personally understand their decision. Their decision now is one of neutrality other than to tell you that, like any trade association, there are a number of members. Most of automobile manufacturers, including GM, have certain interactions with Tesla. Others have certain uh, financial interests. But I, I would, I, my understanding of it, and they can speak for themselves, is that one or more members raised an objection to the, their position of opposing these bills last year, such that now they're neutral. That's that's the best I can ascertain. Okay, I mean you can you can understand from my perspective or from our perspective if you're the only one that is opposing this bill, how that would give members of this committee significant. No, I, I I do understand, and I and I and I can tell you, you know, ironically, uh, my my dad was a car dealer, and I I grew up in the business, and I worked in almost every facet. I I, I can tell you as I, I've watched these things progress in my <clears throat> states, New Jersey in particular, you know, auto dealers and auto dealers associations have have received a number, numerous uh, bad press articles about their opposition to these bills. I don't know if that's a factor here or not. Again, uh, Mr. Kitzmiller speaks for himself, but right. it, it's something that's crossed my mind because I, I did anticipate your question, and um, I think it's a, it's a fair one. And, and forgive me being a little boastful, but uh, GM um, is very uh, important to Maryland. Maryland is important to GM, and we like to think we're the industry leader here and, and have been a strong voice, and we do have a facility here, and no other manufacturer does. So I think our right. voice, you know, with respect to our competitors, may be stronger. Right. And, and I noted in your testimony, um, you mentioned that it was um, your, one of your concerns is it, is it provides for an uneven playing field. Can you speak to that yeah no and, and I think that's the crux of our, our concerns so if you look at Maryland franchise law you see uh, prohibitions and prescriptions on almost everything that or many things that a manufacturer can do in regarding regards to the marketing sales and service of its vehicles the number of how, how their how their dealerships are uh, are branded how they look uh, how warranty reimbursement prices are are arrived at so there's a whole body of law and in many other states as well it's not just maryland that governs sort of this relationship and again it's a challenge the the market is constantly changing the law it's impossible for any legislative body to keep up with all these changes but we do it and so do every other manufacturer so to say that well you know there's a tesla is innovative and in, on cutting edge technology well you know, as Mr. Kitzmiller said, every, most manufacturers have electric vehicles. GM started it in 1995 with this EV1. Um, and we're operating under those laws. We're operating successfully. We're, we're happy with our dealer body and what they're doing. 
So why, does, why doesn't every other automobile manufacturer have to abide by those same statutory prescriptions? Right. And so I guess, uh, I guess one of my concerns or responses to, to that would be that I think that in, in some cases you need to, um, uh, to make exceptions or to help industries grow or to help industries survive. And in one of those cases you have, you know, 2007, 2008, um, the American taxpayer bailed out General Motors to the tune of several billion dollars, which my understanding is was paid back, which is wonderful. But that's an example of going outside or thinking outside the box to make sure that an industry survives and the jobs stay and the business continues to grow. And, and I think that was a good thing. But with that said, on the uneven playing field, I mean, from my numbers, it looks like Tesla in 2013 sold uh, a roughly 22,477 cars. And in that same year, General Motors sold 9.71 billion, I mean, a million cars worldwide. So there's a, you get what I'm driving at here? I, I, I mean, do. No, no I, pun on the driving part. But, <laughs> it, you know, there was exceptions made to, to, yeah. to ensure that General Motors, a great, um, amazing, a traditional American company could stay in business. Right. And this is an, another but, great but I, American yeah. traditional company that's, that's struggling to get up and running. So exceptions were made. Now... But I don't think the analogy is exactly apt, you know, when you're talking about, you know, the historical crisis of the, of the recession. You know, General Motors proudly employs almost 90,000 United States workers. Mm -hmm. You know, and it also, I think your question is premised on the fact that Tesla does have a hurdle in front of it, and it's, which is impeding its ability to operate and to sell cars to Maryland consumers. It really doesn't. I mean, you, you, you know, the, the, the whole idea about the, the uh, study in the article that Mr. Kitzmiller and the Tesla representative referred to about, you know, look, we don't want our cars next to internal combustion engines sitting on the same showroom floor because we know what's going to happen. Well, I can tell you that you, Tesla would have automobile dealers and other entrepreneurs lining up and willingly entering into contractual agreements tomorrow to say, look, we'll have a separate facility. There won't be, won't be anywhere near an internal combustion engine, and we'll abide by all of what you want us to do. Training, customer service, uh, customer sales, the same experience that the, the consumers testified to today. There's no hurdles. So it's a, it's a as, as the representative said, a conscious business decision that they make, which I respect, we make conscious business decisions every day about the marketing, manufacturing, and sale of our vehicles. Right. I, I, a delegate, I, I've got three others gotcha. who want to ask questions. Right. Let me go Thank on you. here. Uh, two. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks for your testimony. I appreciate the uh, business and the work that GM brings to the state. Thank you. Um, and I also, I like the Spark. I think it's a it's a good vehicle. I didn't know that there was an electric vehicle option. I thought that it was just a plug-in hybrid, but I'm learning from you now that there's going to be an electric vehicle soon. Yes, and the reason you would you would you would have no reason to know because the vehicle was only sold. The motor was made here in Maryland, but the vehicle was only sold in California and Oregon, and now it's going to be available to a third state, Maryland, I'm happy to say, which, again, the price will be $18,000, which I know there were questions about the, the uh, medium income of Tesla owners, but this will be something that's available to you know, everyday Marylanders. We'd love to but, sell a few Sparks and Volts while we're here through our good dealers. So, uh, but it's is, a good is a Volt is that is there going to be an all electric model too, or is that just well, I mean, plug you know, hybrid? The, the 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 Volt the Volt is an all electric vehicle. The ELR is an all electric vehicle with one exception. It has a gasoline fed generator on the car, which will kick in in case you uh, run run through your battery charge. So it's it's designed to to get over sort of the consumer range anxiety of the early adopters of people who are choosing to uh, purchase electric vehicles and to make, make that decision. But you, you can ostensibly drive a Volt or an ELR without one ounce of gasoline if you're within the uh, uh, range of the battery. Okay, but it does have a... It has a gas-fed gas generator on board a, that can... And a gas know, tank and... As a gas tank, that the gas it doesn't, tank it's not an internal combustion engine. It's an electric vehicle, but it has this backup that drives the, the uh, wheels. Right, but the backup is an internal combustion engine. I don't know if it's, it's an burning internal burning gasoline. I, it's, I, my understanding is a generator, it. but yes. It, it could burn gasoline if you run all out of your charge. Right, after 40 miles The, or the so. Spark EV is totally electric. GM just announced uh, at the Chicago Auto Show that it has a new Chevrolet coming out that's called the Bolt with a B. 
and that that is going to have extensive range, probably around 200 miles, and that also is going to be a, probably around a thirty thousand dollar car. Okay. Currently, then under except for I'm sorry, that was awkward. <laughs> as soon as I finish knocking my colleague's uh, papers off his desk, uh, are there currently other than the Nissan Leaf any other electric cars that are all electric that are sold in Maryland that don't have backup? engines or generators or whatever I I don't know I, I believe the answer is yes yes okay which which ones uh, the Toyota may have one I know I Mr. think Toyota has one I'm not sure mr. Kitzmiller was alluding to okay. them before um, I'm not I can't rattle them off but I, I can get okay. back to you with that information that, that would be great because my understanding is there isn't and the leaf I mean er, in earlier testimony the leaf was brought up as a vehicle that won't get you uh, to work and back if you have an 85 mile round trip commute, but a Tesla would. So I'm thinking if I did have a long commute, which I had, um, right now, that would be the only all electric option that would work for me, but I'd have to leave the state of Maryland to do it currently. Yeah, but I mean, with the price point of those vehicles, you probably have another car that you would use on your commute. You know, if, if to, to, I mean, the difference between a Leaf and a Tesla, the price is, you know, there's a great divide there. I mean, but I, I, I you're, you're I think looking at my off the rack suit and making a judgment. I get it, you're right. <laughs> but, uh. <laughs> no, okay. thank you. Thank you Let, this is deteriorated. Let's go to the next. Uh, <laughs> next question goes to Shelly Flanagan. Well, these, these other manufacturers, Honda uh, or any of the other manufacturers that maybe don't have electric vehicles, uh, they wouldn't be able if this bill was enacted as uh, as proposed by its sponsor they would not benefit from this no legislation no sir this is a very narrow bill for tesla okay so that would have a tendency to discourage those other companies from uh, trying to develop electric cars would it not to be at a disadvantage uh, to one particular manufacturer yes you know, I, I, I don't quite know how to answer that, uh, sir. I mean, I, I think maybe on some levels, but on others, you know, they, you know, Honda and all the other manufacturers operate successfully within, in full compliance with Maryland law with their automobile dealers. I don't know that any manufacturers are looking to sell directly. To the extent that Honda was looking to sell directly to uh, their consumers, then I, then I think the answer is definitely yes. Uh, we, we heard Tesla uh, refer to as a, uh, a struggling company. I, I, I'm looking at some information on the Internet. Is it correct that they were what? They, they were um, went on the stock market in 2010. Is that about right, if, if you recall? I'm sorry. I don't know. Okay. And my information about their, their uh, capitalization, I guess when we say capitalization, it's a, as in – being capitalist, right? I mean, Tesla is a for-profit company, like like General Motors. That's is a my understanding. Company. That's my understanding. So we're, I guess, we're all capitalists in that sense, right? Yes. And and am I correct that, uh, or maybe you don't know that the the capitalization of of Tesla is twenty five billion dollars? I do not know. Okay. Do Do you have any reason to think that your competitor Tesla is uh, struggling or having? Um, you know, financial problems that you know of or that has I, been I do, made public? No, I, I do not. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, was intrigued by the notion that the other manufacturers used to be opposed to this, but they've dropped their opposition, and General Motors is the only one left standing, and it gave rise to a question in my mind as to why that might be. And it started thinking about how the other manufacturers in recent years have been treated differently, come through the greatest uh, uh, financial challenge this nation has had in, since the 1930s. Um, and Ford took a bailout, if you will, and I don't say that term pejoratively, right. but Ford took federal monies, uh, didn't take federal right. monies, and General Motors right. did. Um, and that's been changed, and it's been alluded to by delegate, uh, the delegate from Montgomery County. But something else changed. 
that makes you an outlier from the other manufacturers and so I need to ask you about that your your ownership structure changed dramatically so your business model changed as a result of that dramatically if my understanding is correct in that the labor unions took a large ownership stake now in the General Motors Corporation is, is that true or not I, I can get back to you with that information easily uh -oh. enough, but I, I do not know. Never mind. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have okay. no more questions of this witness. Any further questions for these two gentlemen? If not, um, thank you very much. And that concludes the public thank hearing you very much. for House Bill 235. And we will uh, go to the last bill of the, eve of the day, and that is House Bill 339, 